the book of Revelation. God's Master Performance Recognized as one of the world's leading authorities on Bible prophecy, Dr. Hilton Sutton. And now a complete study of the book of Revelation. Chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Let us continue in chapter 17. And our last statement, was found in verse 6, and I saw the woman, this is the harlot, drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. So uh, John, now you must remember that John, by the Holy Spirit, is from his post of advantage able to see the future. So he sees this harlot again operating in a large dimension. And now we're going to begin to get some understanding about her and the seven-headed beast and the ten horns. But the angel said to John, Why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw was, used to it exist, and is not, ceased existing, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Oh, here comes our explanation. <clears throat> Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. And the beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven, and is going to perdition or destruction. Now we've got explanation of the beast with seven heads. John tells us, you remember, those heads are crowned. In chapter 12, he tells us that they are the seven mountains on which this harlot has set or controlled or influenced. Now, I grew up being taught that this meant the seven hills of Rome, therefore the harlot was the Roman Catholic Church. And if you were taught that, what you were taught and what I was taught is not Bible. It is taught out of hatred for the Roman Catholic Church. You say, are you defending the Roman Catholic Church? No, I'm not defending the Roman Catholic Church. She has a number of chapters in her history that I'm sure she would rather not have mentioned. But I don't hate the Roman Catholic Church. I was taught such hatred for the Roman Catholic Church that many of the people I grew up with hated Catholics. Now, I had a problem because all of my family on my mother's side were Irish Roman Catholics. I had a serious problem. Do we hate? No, not God's people. That's a human characteristic that ought to be overcome and the characteristic of love take its place. But by no stretch of the imagination is the harlot the Roman Catholic Church. Now let's find out why. This word mountain as it is used here, is not symbolizing a pile of rock. It is identifying a kingdom, an empire. And this is true throughout the scripture. It's like the word sea, S-E-A. Then when you're studying the scripture and the word mountain appears in a passage of scripture, but a mountain is not identified either by name 
or geographical location. If you will re-examine all of the related scriptures, it will be talking about a kingdom or an empire. Daniel uses them interchangeably in his uh, uh, book. So this word mountain then is better interpreted kingdoms. Remember, there was a crown on each one and a king over each one. Verse 10. So we're looking at the seven heads. Here are those kingdoms or empires. The Egyptian empire, the first head. The Assyrian empire, the second head. The Babylonian empire, the third head. The Persian empire, the fourth head. The Greek empire under Alexander the Great, the fifth head. Notice, if you will, that John said, there are seven kings, five have fallen, and one is. What was that? The sixth head. What was the empire or kingdom existing in the days that John received this prophecy? The Roman Empire. Now, it was the Roman Empire that was the head that was struck a mortal blow. And it was Jesus who struck that blow, and Daniel chapter 2 will tell you that. I mentioned it earlier in the week, but you'll remember in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. In his dream, he saw the, a great image of a man who had a golden head, silver chest and arms, brass belly and thighs, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay. And he saw a stone cut out without hands, a sovereign act of God. And that stone came and struck the image uh, uh, at its feet. Part of the Roman Empire. Who was the stone? Jesus. Jesus struck the death blow to the Roman Empire, according to Daniel chapter 2, and brought down the whole image. And if you will take the time to read Daniel chapter 2, verses 34 and 35 and 44 and 45, you're going to discover that that stone was to become a great kingdom and fill the whole earth. So Jesus came during the Roman Empire, struck that empire, a death blow, set up the foundation for the church, and the church is in the process of being the kingdom of God on the earth today, and we will fill the whole earth. Hallelujah. So by no stretch of the imagination can you make the seven mountains the seven hills of Rome. If you're looking for a city with seven hills, you probably have one or two in Canada. There are several in the United States. All right. Now notice, each head was crowned. Each horn was crowned. There were five kings. He, or, or, ten, or seven kings, five had fallen. One is yet. The other is not yet come. And when he comes, the seventh one, he must continue a short time. Not at length. A short time. Well, I said to you a moment ago that as of the 1st of January, 1995, the seventh head became prophetically operational. It is now in existence. It began to come into being in 1957 when England, excuse me, France, Belgium, Holland, Lutz, Luxembourg, West Germany, and Italy formed the common market, the European Economic Community. It remained a six-nation group until the 1st of January, 1973, when England, Ireland, and Denmark join the common market, bringing it up to a total of nine. It remained a nine-nation group until the 1st of January, 1981, when Greece became the 10th member. When Greece became the 10th member in 1981, that group was then prophetically identifiable. Notice my terminology, please. Prophetically identifiable as the 
formation of the seventh head, the seventh head by ten horns. We're going to read in a moment that those ten horns are nations. In 1991, the common market became 12 nations when Spain and Portugal joined the common market. It remained 12 nations until January the 1st of this year when Austria became the 13th member of the common market, making it prophetically operational. Why so? When you study Daniel chapters 7 and 8, Daniel speaks of the ten horns. And he says in the midst of the ten horns will come up a little horn. That's the Antichrist. And this little horn will uproot three of the original ten. If he did so, that would only leave him with seven. But we're going to read shortly that when he comes for the battle of Armageddon, he does not have seven armies, he has ten. So of necessity, that group has to number 13. So when he destroys three, he still has 10 supporting him. Immediately, three weeks ago, the common market declared seven of our nations are now opening their borders to all of their population. And there are now seven nations in Europe that you need no passport or identification to go from one nation to the other, just like you don't need anything uh, to go from one province to the other or I from one state to the other. So they will now determine how that they can all do the same thing and develop a common currency exchange which they have not been able to do here before. You will remember, some of you, that the common market set a goal for itself in 1991. They said on January the 1st, 1993, we will enter the world marketplace as one European nation of states. Did they succeed? No. They still are not uh, under one central government. None of them have given up their sovereignty nor their currency. But they missed their goal. Why did they miss their goal? It simply was not time for that to happen. Remember, God is in control, not man. All right? You, you have to keep that in mind, folks. When you see some prophecies beginning to come to pass, uh, and uh, remember, God stays in control, and he controls everything. So the common market was about to get ahead of itself by coming into the world marketplace as one European nation of states. But there were so many of those nations that said, we're not ready to give up our sovereignty nor our currency, and they have not been able to put it together yet. But the moment they became 13 nations uh, 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 in January, then uh, early uh, uh, this month, seven of them said, our borders are now open uh, and we're ready to exchange currencies with one another and uh, all of our population can just flow from one uh, 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 nation to the other. Soon it's going to be one European state to another, or one European province uh, uh, to another under one central government. That's what they're working toward. But the seventh head now exists. And notice what we read. And the eighth, notice that the seventh one doesn't last too long. And the eighth is of the seventh and going to perdition. That's what is said of the Antichrist, that he is uh, uh, the, the man of sin, the son of perdition. So the eighth is none other than the Antichrist who will have control of the common market, the European economic community. But at mid-tribulation, he will not only just be their leader, He's suddenly going to take absolute control. And for the next three years, he is the eighth head of that evil system. Have you got that? Now, that's simple. That is not complicated. And it answers a, a host of questions. And it eliminates a lot of speculation that prophetic teachers do. 
If you listen to prophetic teachers on, on television, the most of them will spend 70% of their time speculating and not giving you biblical explanation at all. I am giving you biblical explanation. And I trust uh, uh, that you uh, are spiritually minded enough that you will accept what the scriptures uh, are declaring rather than someone's speculation. Amen? All right, let's read on. And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings, national leaders. We don't have many kings today, but we've got uh, national leaders who have received no kingdom as yet. Now, they uh, have been leading their nation, but... Let's read on to find out what's going to take place. But they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind and will give their power and authority to the beast. Now, what they are to receive by giving their power and authority to their chosen leader, who is the Antichrist, what they are to receive is when he comes into control of the world as the devil wants him to. Of course, we've already discovered he won't do that. He won't succeed. But he thinks he's going to succeed. And he promises them in exchange for their power and their allegiance, he promises them that they will rule over one-tenth of the earth under him. That's the exchange for their power and allegiance that they will be one of the ten uh, world uh, leaders under him should he conquer the world, which he doesn't, of course. Now, <clears throat> notice there of one mind will give their power and authority to the beast. These same ones, ten of them, notice it's ten, not seven. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, uh, and those that are with him when he overcomes them are called, chosen, and faithful. Now this verse 14 is giving us a preview of the battle of Armageddon that we'll pick up in chapter 19. So these ten kings, now if, if, if they were only ten to start with and he destroyed three and it came time for the battle of Armageddon, he'd only have seven. But please notice, when it's time for the battle of Armageddon, he has ten. And tonight the number of the common market is perfect for that to happen. You say, could other nations in the near future join the common market? Yes. But if they do, in due course of time, you're going to see some others drop out. I'm praying that England will drop out. I'm seriously praying. I have no uh, uh, major influence in England. I hope to have. And uh, uh, when I do, I'm going to uh, uh, seriously uh, uh, exercise it uh, in as many areas as I can to, to try to convince them to drop out of the common market. It is headed for destruction. Say, why are you concerned for England? May I tell you quickly. I stood in the cathedral at Canterbury not too long ago. And while in the cathedral of Canterbury with my wife and a young couple that traveled, traveled with us, the presence of God began to fill that ancient cathedral. It was glorious. The presence of God was so heavy, we were in the the uh, pulpit and altar area and the area where the royal family sits. And the presence of God became so strong, I wanted to prostrate myself on the floor, but I felt like I don't dare move. I don't want to disturb uh, this divine presence. When I heard my, when I, we'd all divided looking at various and sundry artifacts. None of us were within 15 or 20 feet of each other. And I began to hear my wife declare, God is in this place. And then I heard the young man uh, 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 with me uh, 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 make a statement similar to that. And in that divine presence, God spoke to me. And he said, I am not through with England. I am not finished with this cathedral. And I said, Sir, and he repeated it, I am not finished with England, and I am not through with this cathedral. And then that divine presence that was so strong began to lift. When it had lifted sufficiently, 
the four of us came together very quickly to discuss what we had sensed during that time. I was to learn before leaving that the cathedral can be used for special services. I am soon going to begin the uh, initial steps to secure the Cathedral of Canterbury for an all-British Isles crusade. Now, folks, I'm telling you, God's at work. God's at work. And God has blessed me with a few family credentials. My great, great, great cousin Charles Sutton was the Archbishop of Canterbury from 1805 to 1823. I have credentials. I've already been, uh, I've already been uh, uh, through the church to check some things out. Folks, pray. God's going to do great things from this point on. You just won't get ready for it and start praying and believing God for it. So I'm praying that England will drop out of the common market. Amen? So, and there's some good things happening over there. Believe me, there is. Let's go on. Now, because there's a lot of material to cover, and they're going to push the clock back a, a little bit uh, the other way. Now, so uh, he says that these uh, ten kings uh, are going to make war with the Lamb at the Battle of Armageddon. Verse 15, and he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are people, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot and make her desolate, naked, eat her flesh, burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind, and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. Now why do these kings hate the harlot? Because she has influentially, religiously controlled the people, not them. Follow me. The majority of the people of the world are controlled by religion, not governments. Governments can change, and the people go right on in their religious involvement. It's amazing. So this harlot, they hate. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth, and many have interpreted that right away as Rome. That's not Rome. The harlot is not the Roman Catholic Church. The harlot has been around since the Egyptian Empire. The Roman Catholic Church did not exist then. The harlot was around for the Assyrian Empire. The harlot came into her zenith during the Babylonian Empire, was around for the uh, uh, Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and the Roman Empire. The Roman Catholic Church didn't exist in those days. Think, folks. And so the city is not Rome. What city has major control over the world's leaders at this present time? Follow me. There is a city in which the World Bank is headquartered. There is a city in which the World Council of Churches is headquartered. The same city and the World Council of Churches is the present-day identity of the harlot. The goal of the World Council of Churches? Bring all religions together under one central covering. That's the harlot. That same city that houses the headquarters of the World Council of Churches and the World Bank is the city where all of our national leaders go to work out their treaties and agreements with one another. We call it Geneva, Switzerland. Have you paid any attention to the tiny little nation of Switzerland sitting in the heart of Europe? World wars have been fought around it for hundreds of years and never touched an inch of their territory. That's the city that the biblical reference is made to. Now, I'm giving you facts, folks. This is not speculation. I'm giving you facts. Chapter 18. Now, chapter 18 is, in a sense, an informational chapter, but it is uh, uh, 
pretty much an obituary for this harlot religious system, and let's see how permanent the destruction is. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen, and become the habitation of demons and the prison of every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Now, you'll remember we met this angel of verse 2 in chapter 14 and uh, verse 8. So it's the same angel that we read about in chapter 14, verse 8. We're reading about it again in chapter 18, verse 2. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of, the, of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Notice verse 4. Come out of her, my people. This harlot religious system now involves many of our major denominations in whom there are people who are born again and love the Lord with all their heart. But they're still in their denominational church. In due course of time, and I don't think it's very much further down the road, there will be a strong call for the Holy Spirit from the Holy Spirit for those folks to leave that denominational structure when it is very evident that it is headed toward permanent membership with the world. Council of Churches. The World Council of Churches denies the virgin birth. The World Council of Churches denies the deity of Jesus. The World Council of Churches uh, uh, denies the infallibility of the scripture. The World Council of Churches denies the power of God. And yet many of our major denominations are already members. And some of you perhaps are members of those churches. And some of the money that you put into your churches goes to support the harlot. The time will come, and the Holy Spirit is going to make a very direct a statement to you, and you're going to have to make a change. You'll have to leave that church or partake of her plagues and her sins. You say, that's too strong. I didn't write it. The Holy Ghost did. Take it up with him. All right, let's read on. Re render unto her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she mixed, mixed for her double. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxur luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and am no widow and will not see sorrow. Therefore her plagues will come in one day, death and mourning and famine. And she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. Remember in, the, in chapter 17, the Lord will put it in the uh, minds of those ten kings to destroy her. And the kings of the earth who committed fornication with her and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning spirit standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. Merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones, pearl, fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet, and every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble, and cinnamon, and incense, fragrant oil, and frankincense, and wine, and oil, and fine flour, and wheat, cattle, and sheep, horses, and chariots, and bodies, and souls of men. And the fruit that your soul longed for has gone from you, and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you, and you shall find them no more at all. You're, you're discovering that the destruction of this harlot religious system is permanent. There'll never be anything like it again. Let's read on. Uh, uh, this is extremely uh, powerful. 
And the merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour such great riches came to nothing. And every shipmaster and all who traveled by ship, sailors and as many as trade on the sea, stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this? great city and they threw dust on their heads and cried out weeping and wailing and saying alas alas that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth for in one hour she is made desolate rejoice over her O heaven and you holy apostles and prophets for God has avenged you on her then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. Now notice how permanent the sound of harpists, musicians, flautists, trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore, and no craftsman of any craft shall be found in you anymore, and the sound of the millstone shall not be heard in you anymore, and the light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore, and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall not be heard in you anymore, for your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery, enchantments with drugs, all nations were deceived, and in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth. And that confirms what I said to you uh, in our last session, uh, that religion has been responsible uh, for the major wars uh, that have been fought in the history of the world. Chapter 19. After these things, I heard a loud voice in heaven of a great multitude saying, where are they? In heaven. Saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power to the Lord our God. <clears throat> now this, this action in chapter 19 is taking place in heaven. We've been uh, getting insight from informa informational chapters concerning the destruction of a harlot religious system. The destruction of this harlot religious system comes near the point of mid-tribulation. Why? Were she still existing in this half, she would be an affront to the Antichrist who is announcing himself God. He has used the harlot in order to acquaint himself with the people whom she has influenced. Now he is ready to have her removed, and God goes along with it. And so she is destroyed. Now what we're about to find in the 19th chapter then is happening in heaven just a short time later. These, this, this great multitude in heaven, who's up there by this time? The church company's up there. The mid-tribulation saints are up there. The 144,000 are up there. Quite a company up there. And they're saying, hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power to the Lord our God for true and righteous are, your, are his judgments because he has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. And again they said, hallelujah, and her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants <coughs> and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Can you just imagine all that host up there in unison saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns? It'll come rolling out of heaven uh, like a clap of thunder the world has never heard before. Praise God. <clears throat> Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Now we're discovering in chronological order that the marriage of the Lamb comes after mid-tribulation. And his wife has made herself ready. 
unto her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Notice, if you will, that the saints adorn the bride. Think carefully. Let's read on. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. So after the wedding of the Lamb comes the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he says, blessed are they who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Well, the church company is there, the great multitude at mid-tribulation, the 144,000 are all there for the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's going to be a banquet celebration, the like of which none of us have ever attended before. You say, are we going to eat? Yes. Why would you have supper and not eat? You say, won't we be in glorified bodies? Yes. Then we won't need to eat. You're right. But I ain't often not needing to eat. And you ought to know that God won't take anything so good as eating away from us. Now, remember, there's real food in heaven. There's real food in heaven. Remember, the angels eat real food. That food is grown in heaven. Processed in heaven and prepared in heaven. All right? Oh, it's interesting. So the wedding of the Lamb followed by the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said, uh, blessed are they that are called to the ma marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that, John. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Folks, every time you share your testimony of Jesus, in a sense, biblical sense, you're prophesying to that person you're sharing it with that they too can have the same thing. See this. Your testimony is vitally important. Then I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. Now, here's our second white horse. We had a white horse in the first uh, uh, verse of chapter 6, but it was written by the Antichrist. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. And his eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. Remember the fellow in the other chapter didn't have any crown, one had to be given to him. And he had a name written that no one knew uh, except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. We know the rider of this white horse. This is none other than Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now, in chapter 17, verse 14, notice, and those that are with him, when he overcomes the ten uh, armies of the Antichrist at the Battle of Armageddon, and those that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful, those three New Testament words always identify the church. Remember, we go up as a glorious church, the body of Christ, an army, according to the teachings of the Apostle Paul. And seven years later, we come back as an army. This same company that we read about in 17, verse 14, and now chapter 19, verse 14, this same company is referred to by the prophet Zechariah in chapter 14, verse 5, as the saints. So we've got clear biblical identification. Who is this? The church. Taken up before the tribulation, enjoying all of the great ceremonies uh, and worship uh, through this seven-year period in heaven, and then coming back to the earth with Jesus at the end uh, of that seven-year period, and we come back as his army, the church, the saints. Let's keep reading. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. What nations? Those ten that we read about in chapter 17, verse 14, the followers of the Antichrist, plus that vast Oriental army that had joined. Now he doesn't strike the Oriental nations, he strikes that army. 
And uh, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. What is that? That's his word. That with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress that we read about in chapter 14. The winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Oh, no problem identifying him. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come, gather together for the supper of the great God. Now this has nothing to do with the marriage feast. And only birds are called to this supper. You wouldn't want to eat what they're going to eat. That you may eat the flesh uh, uh, of uh, kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and those that sit on them, the flesh of all people free and slave, by, both small and great. Th those that came uh, with the Antichrist to the battle of Armageddon. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him. That's that same group we read about in chapter 17, verse 14. Uh, to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast, that's the Antichrist, was captured. And with him the false prophet who also who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two, the Antichrist and the false prophet, were cast alive into the lake burning with lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the rest, all of their followers, were killed with the sword of him which proceeded out of, of, of his mouth uh, who sat on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. <clears throat> now to, to uh, pick up on that sword, you go to Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 12. In Zechariah 14, 12, when Jesus from the Mount of Olives, and you get this information from that chapter, when Jesus from the Mount of Olives uh, is facing uh, uh, the battle site of Armageddon, on the west, on the northwest side of the city of Jerusalem, he will speak the word. When he speaks the word, it releases the plague of Zechariah 14, 12. That plague will cause that huge armada of people to suddenly be blind and dumb. Their eyes and their tongue will consume away. They are stricken with a panic of fear. And in their fear, they reach to touch somebody for security but they don't know what's touching them, and they begin to fight among themselves. And while they're fighting among themselves, the plague continues to operate, and their flesh begins uh, uh, to melt away from their skeleton. As it melts away from their skeleton, their blood will gush to the earth. Uh, the earth is not able to absorb it rapidly enough, and it will rise to the depth of a horse bridle and cover an area of some 200 miles, and it all happens in one hour. That's all. That's the Battle of Armageddon, folks. Whew. Chapter 20. Now the Battle of Armageddon is over, and Jesus has strolled from the Mount of Olives across the little valley of Kidron, and he's back in the temple, on the Temple Mount. Hallelujah. And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that, old, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things... He must be released for a little while. That will be explained as we keep reading. And I saw thrones. Notice it's plural. Whose thrones are these? Yours. Remember, we're coming back with him as his army, but we're also coming back as kings and priests to reign on the earth with him. Those are our thrones. And they that sat upon them, and judgment was committed to them. We will have authority to rule over the people that survived the tribulation. And they're going to be people from many nations. Even, Zechariah tells us in chapter 14, even of the nations that the Antichrist had control over, there will be people in those nations that did not take his mark, did not worship his image, 
and survive and come into the thousand year reign of Christ. With chapter 20, we're now in the thousand year reign of Christ. We're out of the tribulation and we're in the millennial reign. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's read on. And uh, he goes on to say that uh, uh, we will have judgment. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God and who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. Now, I know there's some folks going around saying it's in the head and it's in the hand. Read the scripture. Read the scripture. I know there's a teacher from New Zealand uh, uh, that's teaching some very strange things. He teaches a lot of doom and gloom. Do not follow him. I'll tell you that now. The mark is on their head or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Those that had suffered martyrdom are resurrected. And they come in and live and reign with Christ and all of us for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead, what dead is that? The wicked dead. That's the only dead left. The wicked dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So uh, uh, the first resurrection, follow me carefully, is made up of the resurrection and the catching up of the living saints uh, before the tribulation. The 144,000, uh, excuse me, the converts of the 144,000, the 144,000, and then the resurrection of the two witnesses and the catching up of the two witnesses and the resurrection of the uh, martyred saints. Seven different acts make up the first resurrection. The resurrection of the wicked dead has no part of the first resurrection. That comes at the end of the thousand year reign of Christ. Let's read on. So he says, blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. Now we learned that the second death is the lake of fire. Well, none of those that were in any of these seven acts are going to have any part of the uh, lake of fire. So they make up the first resurrection. And it's the wicked dead resurrected at the end of the thousand year reign that will be uh, uh, turned uh, to, to the lake of fire, the second death. And... Uh, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Those that are part of the first resurrection, not the wicked. Now when the thousand years have expired, and during that time, that thousand year period, go to Isaiah. Run your references, in, in, particularly in Isaiah, for what takes place during the millennium. Uh, Jesus will be ru ruling every nation. We will be ruling and reigning here with him, all with firm authority. Firm authority, that means there are people on the earth unsaved. We're going to read in chapter 21 that during that period of time, entire nations get saved. Well, if nations get saved, it's because somebody is preaching the gospel to them. So the gospel will be preached to the unsaved people that survived the tribulation so that they too can have an opportunity to accept the mercy of God. God is just. Amen? During the, during the thousand year reign, if one dies who is a hundred years of age, Isaiah says, he will be considered a child. So longevity of life is restored. Very little death. If there's death, it'll be the results of some that came out of this period unsaved and already had some very horrible thing working in them. And if they don't accept Jesus, then it can bring an end to their life. No wild animals. The lion shall lie down with the lamb, the wolf and the calf eat side by side. No uh, 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 harmful snakes, child playing out in the yard and finds uh, uh, the viper's den, not be harmed. No air pollution, no water pollution, absolute righteousness and peace. Wonderful, wonderful. Whew, great time. When the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are on the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. Please do not confuse this Gog and Magog with the Gog and Magog of Ezekiel 38 and 39. The Gog and Magog of Ezekiel 38 and 39 come from a fixed geographical area. And Ezekiel fixes it. This Gog and Magog is from all around the world. So it's not the same company at all. 
He goes on to say, And they went up on the breath of the earth, following Satan, and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. What's that? Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them that followed Satan. And the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So why is Satan released just for a short time? It says a little season, just a matter of weeks, not long. Why? Because during the thousand-year reign of Christ, people living on the earth will be having children. It's a thousand-year period. No death. No tempter. No temptation. They're, no, they're never confronted by Satan. If God did not release him to go among them so that if there are those among them that still have not accepted Christ, and during that time, they have to worship him whether they want to or not because we rule with firm authority. And that's required of them according to uh, Zechariah chapter 14. That's required of them. Well, you know how some folks are. They can, they'll say, well, I may be sitting down, but I'm standing up inside. And that'll be the case with some of them. Satan is released, goes among the people. All of those that haven't been saved will be tempted by him and they will follow him. That's the reason he gets a following. His following is destroyed instantly by supernatural fire and Satan is cast into the lake of fire to join the false prophet and the Antichrist. Now, if God did not release him, all of the people who had died previously in sin and had to come before the great white throne judgment to be judged could say to God, you, sir, are unjust. We, had to overcome Satan and we failed. But all of those people that were born during the millennium never were confronted by him. Didn't have to make a choice. So because God is a just God, he releases Satan at the end of the millennial reign for just a short season. And those that do not want to continue following the Lord or have not accepted the Lord, let me put it that way, will follow him to their utter destruction. Well, let's continue to read. We'll have a tough uh, difficulty getting all of this in this session. <clears throat> so uh, he said, then I saw what? A great white throne. Where's this? In heaven. And him who sat on it, from whose face, we know it's in heaven by the next statement, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. So at the time of the great white throne judgment, this heaven, this present earth and its present heaven uh, is, uh, is, is done away with. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were open. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead, now which dead is this? This is the wicked dead of all the ages. No righteous in this group at all. They are all wicked. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So the wicked of all the ages are resurrected, if you please, Remove from the earth to heaven to be judged by God. All of the righteous, the righteous nations of the nation of Israel, all of the redeemed of the tribulation period, and all the church company, we all go back to heaven for the great white throne judgment. We are not judged there. We've already been judged. And our judgment was good. If you're at the judgment seat of Christ, you made it or you wouldn't be there. Amen? And when the great white throne judgment is finished, then we are ready to occupy the new Jerusalem and descend from heaven with God the Father, God the Son in the new Jerusalem to rest upon the new earth and God will have placed all of the nations and people from heaven back on the new earth. That's chapters 21 and 22 and they are very exciting 
and they told me they just ran out of tape. Thank you.